Everyone, let's go ahead and uh, get started this afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Jason McDermott, and I'm with the Los Angeles and Orange County Audio Society. It is my distinct pleasure to turn the mic over, turn the platform over to John Atkinson. Uh, John is the editor of Stereophile Magazine, a position he's held since 1986, and has been uh, in the uh, industry for over 30 years, um, and has guided Stereophile through uh, significant growth in the last 30 years uh, for a publication that's been around over 50 years, which is quite amazing. And uh, John uh, is implemented a, a measurement technique or, or measurements into Stereophile in the late 80s and has measured over 1,500 components since that time and uh, Stereophile is the only company that's doing that or the only uh, the only magazine that's doing that which is uh, quite remarkable. So we're very fortunate to have John here today. Um, he's been a great friend to the show in Newport and one of the chief reasons that we're here today talking to you. The support of Stereophile and Stereophile magazine and John himself uh, just uh, being here and uh, supporting the efforts of uh, what we're doing here in Southern California has been very much appreciated. So uh, we're, we're very excited to have John with us today. So please give a warm Southern California welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to be talking about stereo imaging for the next 45 minutes. So really, as close as you can get to the center line between the two speakers here provided by PTE, the better. Um, so if you want to shuffle over. If not, then not everything I say will be audible. So, uh, Jason mentioned basically that I am a really old guy and have been around for a long time. In fact, May the 1st, I celebrated my 27th anniversary as editor of Stereophile. And for 10 years before that, I was the at Hi-Fi News magazine in the UK. And before that, I worked as a professional musician. So the first piece of music I will play you is from an album my band made in 1976. And it's a disco treatment of Cole Porter's Night and Day. I like the big, 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 dum, 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 the jungle shadow fall. ago. I was playing bass guitar on that track and although I had a scientific education I gave it all up in 72 to go on the road with a band, much to the dismay of my late mother. But that side of me has remained, I've remained active in music and production and engineering ever since, even while my main gig has been on a magazine. In fact you could say that it was the failure of that album which led to me standing here in front of you instead of sipping margaritas with Kanye West in Maui. <laughs> so I've, I've kept busy, as well as editing magazine, I stay in touch with music. The next track I'll play you, this is not from an album I engineered or produced, but I mastered it recently. Stereophile writer Eric Light is a choral director and singer, and he co-produced and edited an album by the Portland State Chamber, Chamber Choir. And I, this was an album called um, Oh, I can't remember a senior moment. Album came out this year, and this is a track from that. The, um, it's called A Salutaris Hostia from the uh, Latvian, or is he Estonian? Latvian, I think, composer Eric Edvardson. And it's called, uh, and uh, just playing it because it was just, it's so beautiful.
change or just cut it off, but the way those two sopranos weave in and out, it's just magical. Um, the next track I'll play you, this is from a project I've been producing the last year or so. A friend of mine, the composer Sasha Mazzi, composed an opera about baseball. It's called Cooperstown. Um, we just finished, finished doing all the editing and mastering. Um, I'm going to play you, there's nine acts, of course, because it's about baseball. And I'm going to play you just an extract from the, the overture to Act One. A studio in Brooklyn called Systems 2. I produced, the engineer was Grammy winning engineer Mike Marciano. And one of the beauties of recording in a studio like that is they have this access to great equipment. For the tenor saxophone, we used John Coltrane's own ribbon microphone, RCA ribbon, which his son Ravi leaves at the studio and allowed us to use. The Hammond organ you hear, the B3, was the very organ that the group Vanilla Fudge used on their first album. You, and you know, I sat at it and thought, wow, I'm mean, going to play you, you keep me hanging on. <coughs> Maybe people under 60 are not going to get a reference. <laughs> but you know, but I mean, it was just such a pleasure to record in such a great studio. Now, one of the things that, here am I talking about tenor saxophone, Hammond B3. I talked about the, the two sopranos on the, um, Portland State Chamber Pyre recording. I talked about, I played bass guitar on that first recording, the uh, Disco Night and Day. I mean, we needed a mirror ball in here for perhaps for true accuracy. The point that I would like to make in this talk and then illustrate is that none of that is real. There are no saxophones, there are no sopranos, there is no bass guitar. All these are internal constructs that your brain creates in response to complex pressure waves emanating from the two loudspeakers. And everything we talk about at audio files is actually illusory. It's imaginary. So when you get dissed by, you know, a, a so-called objectivist, but, oh, well, everything, it's all in your head, you're all making it up. Well, of course, exactly that, that's what we're doing. We are making it all up. Now, I'll play you something, we're all familiar with this. This is a one kilohertz reference tone at minus 20 dBFS. We're all familiar with that sound. Okay, now I want you to just stay quiet for 10 seconds and imagine that sound. Okay, go. Okay, if you were to do a brain scan of your, your brain's activity, either listening to that tone or imagining it, there would be no difference. The same areas of your brain will light up, the same activity is going on. Your brain is an engine designed to create internal constructs from inadequate and incomplete information reaching your ears. And actually, the, that, the incompleteness can be complete. It can be, there's no sound reaching your ears in the second circumstance, there is in the first. But nevertheless, your brain is doing exactly the same operation. It's creating internal models that allow you to interact with reality. John? Uh, I'll do questions afterwards, please. So, so there is no difference. Your brain, as I said, your brain is constructing internal models based on the information reaching the senses. What I find astonishing about this is that it doesn't happen instantaneously. Particularly with sight, your brain may be a powerful computer, but it's not unlimited. And it takes at least a tenth of a second for you to process the information reaching your eyes and your ears 
and create a model of what is happening in the world outside you. So I found that extraordinary, that we're all actually living at least a tenth of a second in the past, and you can unmask that latency with various psychoacoustic experiments. And if you go to my Richard Heisel lecture reprint on the Sterophile website, in one of the footnotes I give a link to various experiments which have been done to, show, to unmask that latency. So, I'm going to take a real sound source. I play bass guitar, but that's not very transportable with its amplifier, so I brought the smallest possible musical instrument I could bring with me, a cowbell. And of course, everything goes better with more cowbell. Than so, if I bang the cowbell, as I move around the room, you know where I'm standing, you know where the sound of a cowbell is coming from. If I'm off to your left, then the sound is going to be louder in your left ear than in your right ear. If I'm off to your left also, the sound is going to reach your left ear before it reaches your right ear. Similarly, if I move over here, now the sound is going to be louder in your right ear than it is in your left ear, and the sound is going to reach your right ear before it reaches your left ear. The brain uses information, this information to determine direction of sound sources. It also, if I raise the cowbell up or down, the frequency response of, of the sound of the cowbell changes because of these things, your pinup on your ears. When you're high, the sound is different from when you're low. Also, if I move around to the side, again, the frequency response changes due to the effect of the pinup. You can do this if you play pink noise on a loudspeaker and sit in front of it and turn around so your ear is facing the speaker, you hear the actual tonal character of the noise change, and that's because of the effect of your inner. Now, what is the, so recording is about in stereo is about capturing the directions of sound sources. So you can capture a map of all the sound sources between the left and right speakers. Um, the English engineer Alan Dower Blumlein in 1931 described how this is done using amplitude information. You make the sound louder in the left channel, you'll hear it in the left channel, you make it sound right, louder in the right channel, it'll be louder in the right channel, and all positions in between. This is something obviously, you know, that is basic to, if, you, if it sounds too simplistic, bear with me. So here's the cowbell recorded in the left channel. Here it is in the right channel. And, if I play the same signal in both speakers at once, you get this. Think about that. You hear, you're all familiar with this from your own systems, that if you let play the same signal from left and right speakers simultaneously, you don't hear left and right speakers anymore. You hear a single image in the center of the stage. But this is an illusion. It's again, your brain reacting to what it's receiving from its ears and going, well, that, that must be what happened. There must be a sound source in the middle of the stage. But it's an illusion. Um, if I change the amplitude of the cowbell between left and right channels, you hear, the sound, you hear it move across the stage. However, that's just using amplitude information, and 99%, 99.9% of recordings are made using amplitude information between the two channels. The mix engineer says, well, okay, we'll make the singer 100% in the left, zero in the right, so the sound appears to come from the left, vice versa, drums in the middle, maybe saxophones off a little bit to the side. It's all manipulating amplitude information to create the stereo image. But again, you remember, that stereo image is not real. It exists only in your head, and you can't measure it. So it's one of the problems I have as, as a measure of a stereo magazine, that nothing I measure actually correlates with the quality of a stereo image. <clears throat> now, what I can also do, oh, but <clears throat> what I can also do is manipulate the time information. Remember, Aunt Blumlein, <clears throat> over 100 years ago, said, sorry, 80 years ago, said you can manipulate amplitude to create a sound stage. But I can manipulate time. 
This is exactly the same cowbell. Starts out about 800 microseconds advanced in the left channel, and I decrease that difference, and then it ends up about 800 microseconds advanced in the left, right channel. <laughs> Um, for you on the centre line, you will have heard that distinctly, it's much harder off to the sides. But basically, the, again, the cowbell moves across the sound stage, but it's much more, much less stable as it does so. There's a kind of, it seems to rush across the stage. When it's in the centre, it's actually not very well defined. And this is because the brain only uses that time information below around 800 hertz or so. Uses the amplitude information above 2 kilohertz, time information below 800 hertz. And so the brain is much more used to particularly high frequencies using the amplitude information. However, in that last example, the amplitude was the same in both channels all the time. It was only the time difference that was changing. Um, if you make a recording in this manner, discarding amplitude information and only using time information, it's very different from what you're normally used to with your systems. This is a recording I made of Bob Silverman playing a Schubert piece on the piano. And it's only time information in the two channels. The amplitude is the same in both channels. And about a minute in, I did something catastrophic to the, the recording. So let's see if you can hear it. Five seconds in was I inverted the polarity of just the right hand speaker. Now you know from your own systems you have to get the speakers in phase. You have to have both woofers going out together. This one, the woofers are going like that, but you don't hear any difference on the recording. This is because in a time, um, a time stereo recording, there's so little correlation between the two channels that you can do things like that. And and no one makes recordings like this except I did inadvertently in this situation. Now what's interesting about this recording, this was back in 1993, we'd set up a concert and Bob Silverman performed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we were running actually a coincident pair of figure eight mics or a single mic set up to be consumed, consumed in figure eight pattern as the main pickup. Just out of interest, I set up a pair of space only mics and ran those into a separate recorder. After the concert finished, um, I listened to the main recording, which I hadn't been monitoring during the concert, and it was mono. What had happened was the mic had failed and defaulted to coincident omni mics, which is the most useless of all patterns, and had recorded in mono. So all we left with was the space omni recording, which is all time information and, you know, as a and I knew, as a purist engineer at that time, that that was unusable. However, what was interesting was that I played that recording to the pianist and to everyone else at Stereophile, and they said, wow, it sounds really good. And I said, well, it can't sound good. It doesn't have any amplitude stereo information. It's only time. Yeah, but it sounds like the piano in the hall, and it has a nice sense of bloom. I said, okay, well, you know, should we release it? 
well, yeah, it sounds like a piano, piano. Bob Silverman liked it a lot. So we put it out as a stereophile CD called Concert, and it sold well. People liked the sound. And that set me back on my heels a bit because, as I said, I was, being, I was a purist engineer up to that point. I knew that what we were trying to do was create amplitude stereo recordings. And in the world of recording, there's only two microphone techniques which give you amplitude stereo when you're recording with a single pair of mics. And that's either cross figure of eights or what's called middle side recording. This was neither, and yet it sold well. I was castigated on what was then Usenet for this. Some professor at Bloomington, Indiana said, well, this is just disgraceful. It's outrageous. It's irresponsible of you to release a CD made in a way which produces a, 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 you know, a, a, a recording which doesn't have any true stereo information. But it sold. People liked it. And isn't that the point of making recordings, is to make something which people like to listen to? Something that the internal constructs in their brain are pleasing to them. Because that's what it's all about. It's not about engineering, it's not about accuracy, it's not about you know, anything to do with, with measurements. It's about creating, you listening to a recording and your brain creates something that makes you happy. But the important thing to remember is that that is like a third order construct. The first thing that happens is the sound reaches your ears and you create the image of, well, there must have been a bass guitar there and a piano there and a soprano there and a saxophone there. The next thing is the music. Because sounds themselves don't carry information other than what about what they are. It's the music that matters, which is organized sound in time. But that also, that's a second order construct. And what really matters to you is the third order construct, the emotion, the musical meaning that's conveyed by the framework of the music. So, I'll play you the conundrum then presented to a recording engineer is how does he capture a sound which allows you guys to enjoy what he does? Because if I make a totally accurate recording and you guys think it sounds bad, it doesn't stimulate any pleasure, then it's pointless. So I'll illustrate this with a recording I made um, in 2007. I was recording the male voice choir Cantus, of which stereophile writer Eric Light was the music director at that time. And I used three pairs of mics, an almost coincident pair of cardioid microphones, which captures true, almost true amplitude stereo, a pair of spaced omnis, like I did on that piano, which captures the time information, but doesn't give you good amplitude, doesn't give you any amplitude stereo. And a second pair, a third pair of mics, which is a pair of omnis either side of a disc, vertical disc, which is what um, Ray Kimber does with his ISO mic, which is I, supposed to capture both the stereo imaging and the, and the time information. So this is the first one. This is a work by the Chicago composer Maura Bosch. She sent a questionnaire out to prisoners who had been jailed for abusing their wives. And she sent them a standard list of questions. And from the answers she received, she created the lyric for a song cycle called The Turning. This is the first movement, and this is it recorded with the cardioids giving you amplitude stereo. stereo image in that every one of the singers is defined by a by the point in space between the loudspeakers but it's kind of it lacks communication it's it's soulless it's a bit like if you're 
photographing a woman or a man without any clothes. What you want is a nude. You don't want naked. Naked is what we all are under our clothes. Nude is artistic. In fact, it's kind of naked. OK, so here's exactly the same performance recorded with the only microphones to give you a time stereo recording. Uh, set the reverberation, you could adjust with drapes around the edge of the hall. We set it to three seconds to capture that, to allow the sound to bloom and develop. The cardioids didn't capture any of that. The omnis do present that, but the downside is that the stereo image is very unstable. The, the, image, the, singers, the images of the singers are not well defined in space. This is the third recording of the same performance, made with the um, omnis either side of a baffle, a bit like raking the isomite. is accurate to the sound of the singers in the hall? The answer is none of them. Each of those different microphone techniques captures, is optimized for capturing one aspect of the sound, but sacrificing some others. So how do I, as a recording engineer, then create the, the illusion in your brains that you're in that hall sitting, listening to that sound, that choir? And I do it by, do I use taking those three microphone techniques and adjust and mixing them together, adjusting them, the levels and some equalization, so I can get the precise stereo imaging from the cardioids, the sense of the bloom and the low frequency extension from the spaced omnis, because omni mics are really good at bass, they go down to DC in theory, and the, the sense of the hall from the third recording. So this was, this is the mix that I ended up with. This is from a CD called While You're Alive, which came out in 2008. And this is the Turning Movement 1, my mix, my attempt to present you with an accurate sound.
one microphone technique I can use as an engineer, which is accurate. What about the microphones themselves? I'll play, this is a recording we made uh, 20, 23 years ago. We took the Sterifiles founder, J. Gordon Holt, who passed away three years ago. We recorded him with a succession of high quality professional microphones. And so he's recording, and as we see it, essay from an earlier show of Stereophile. And every sentence or so, we change to a different microphone. Why Hi-Fi Experts Disagree, by me, J. Gordon Hall. From Stereophile, Volume 1, Issue 4, dated March, April, 1963. The High Fidelity Initiate, bewitched bothered and thoroughly confused by the staggering selection of components he must choose from, often turns to a high fidelity expert to assist him in assembling his dream system. The expert may be a local consultant, a dealer, or a magazine that the prospective buyer trusts as a source of accurate, down-to-ear information. If this seeker of high fidelity truth is wise, he will consult one expert and no more. The more expert opinions he gets, the more confused he will become because every expert opinion will be different from all other expert opinions. About the only thing that all high fidelity experts agree about is that high fidelity is supposed to be realistic sound reproduction. They may even agree that Morant's amplifiers are pretty good and that Thorin's makes a passable turntable. But try to pin them down about pickups or other amplifiers or tuners or particularly loudspeakers and one expert's preference is another one's anathema. That last microphone really cra cracks me up every time. It's, so it's an Electra Voice RE220, which is the standard for broadcasting. If you look at Rush picture of Rush Limbaugh, that's what he uses. So I mean, so the microphones, the microphones are every time you choose a microphone, you're making a huge, having a huge influence on the sound you're going to record. It can no longer be accurate because the microphone itself is colored. And these are all good professional microphones. The way I use those microphones, the engineers use those microphones, cannot be accurate. It can only, each technique can capture one aspect of, optimize one aspect of reproduction at the expense of others. So, <clears throat> the recording engineer is using, it's an art, not a science. He's using all the tools at his, at his disposal to create something which convinces you that you're hearing something that was real. But it isn't itself accurate. It's an artistic process. It's artifice in the service of art. I'll, I'll demonstrate this with a recording I made with Cantus. Um, this was back in 2004. We were back at Goshen, Indiana, and we were doing a Christmas album. And they wanted to do a, an arrangement of Deck the Halls with Boughs of Holly. And it was a very strange arrangement. It was choir and drums. And I, my heart sunk when they told me about it because how can you balance a choir against drums? Drums are powerful, voices are not. So, we started out. And we did. Mm -hmm. Of course, any expert worth his salt can tell you why there's so much disagreement. The reason? Well, the other experts, although... Here we go. So we started out. <laughs> This is the drums and choir in that beautiful hall. It sounds weak. The drummer is holding back. And because the acoustic is so warm and wet, it's very slow. Musicians adjust their tempo according to the acoustic they're in. The more reverberant it is, the slower they'll play. So, that we rejected that, you can't use that, it's just wimpy. So, we went to the studio, in a studio in St. Paul, the public radio studio, and we recorded it again. This time, choir, and with, with a shakers, no drums. 
faster. Try acoustic. They will sing faster. But it's kind of in your face clear. Again, it's naked, not new. So Eric and I got together and said, we can't use that either. It's just, it's just unpleasant. The first one is too reverberant, too slow, drums sound weak. This one, voice is too clear. It's just in your face. So he said, well, what about if you took the drums from the Goshen session and added them to this? And I said, well, A, they're slower, B, they're too reverberant. And he said, well, surely you can do something. So, one of the, so I went through the original takes and found a single drum measure. So I took that measure and I looped it over and over and over again. There was actually a second measure I found which I added in the loop at various times just to make it sound like it was a real drummer and not some contrivance. contrivance. There was that intro I found at the beginning. So I added that at the beginning of the loop, and I ended up with this. That's the loop. And then I sped it up to match the tempo of the studio recording. And then Eric said, it's, that's a lot better. I added to the singers. That took some manipulation because as good singers they are, their tempo was not completely strict, so I had to shave little bits here and there off the drum track to make it match. And he said, it's still not right, can you add a bass guitar? Because that's what I play. They said, sure. So I added a bass guitar to the drums. So now I had a rhythm track, which is completely fake. I had never played in a hall with a drummer. He had never played with me. In fact, the drummer had never played that part at all. So I then added it to the voices. Then, these are singers, they're young. I thought, well, it's just not, they get into the song too quickly. So what I did in the intro was the tenors come in, la, la, and we originally went, la, 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 la. So what I did was actually think, well, that's just getting into it too quickly. So I took the loop of the bass and drums and added sections in between the tenors. So it just built a little more slowly. And I went, so this is the final mix which appeared on the CD. So it's all, com the singers have never played in the same room as the drums. The drums have never been in the same room as the bass guitar. I did the bass guitar in my listening room back home. And this is the end result. Sorry.
It's completely fake. There is absolutely no reality in that recording. And 99.9% of the recordings you listen to on your own systems are made in a manner akin to that. They are contrivances. They are engineers and producers and musicians creating something which really had no corresponding live event. So when you read in magazines that we compare the sound of, you know, we judge our systems and our loudspeakers and our components by comparing them with the live sound, the sound of live music in a real acoustic space. How do you do that with recordings which are in themselves artificial, where there is no reality? And I think, so, as a reviewer, if you play any one recording that you don't know how it's made, and you listen to it and you think, oh, well, the recording, the imaging is very woozy, therefore these speakers, for example, if that's what I'm reviewing, must have bad stereo imaging. What if it was that piano recording I played, the um, Bob Silverman playing the Schubert Milman Musico? That doesn't have good imaging. So this, an accurate speaker will allow you to hear the woozy stereo imaging on that recording. What if, for example, if you were playing, listening to a vocal recording made with that electro voice mic, the one quacked like that, on accurate speakers, you would hear that quacky sound and you'd go, oh, these speakers are colored. But it isn't the speakers, it's the recording. So you can never, ever form an opinion on the sound of an audio component from listening to one recording. You don't know how it was made. And all recordings, as I said, are artificial, contra artificial constructions designed to make you, your brain create models which are satisfying to you. So, reviewers must use lots of recordings to make their judgments, and so must you. You play as many, a wide a variety of recordings as you can, and listen for the things which stand out which are the same all the time. If you play, if every recording you play, whether it be vocal or piano or orchestral or rock or jazz, has that quacking quality, well, it's unlikely that every engineer would have used that electro voice mic. It's, so it's increasingly likely that the more recordings you listen to, that that's a property of the loudspeaker you're listening to. Um, and that's really the point, that you cannot rely on a simplistic, I judge this by the sound of real music in an acoustic space, because you can be led into error. The point is, when you go to a dealer or you go around a show like this, Listen to as many recordings as you can. Listen to your favorite recordings, but listen to a lot of them. And then listen for the common factors. Is the bass always booby? Is the midrange always quacky? Is the stereo image always diffuse and unstable? And the more recordings you listen to, and the more those things stay the same, then you know that you have, you have identified a property of what you're listening to, not a property of a recording. I'll conclude with a recording I made in 1984, where I just got lucky. Um, the late Peter Walker of Quad allowed me to ask me to record this amateur orchestra he was in. He played flute, and they were recording Elgar's Dream of Gerontius in Ely Cathedral, England, which is one of the most perfect performing spaces ever. So I turned up with my microphones, and the dean said, I'm sorry, we don't allow recording here. And I said, but it's been arranged with Peter Walker. And they said, yes, but they didn't consult me. So I said, well, I, I'm here now, where, and I'd all planned where I was going to put my mics. And he said, well, you can't put your mics anywhere. Can you not have a cassette recorder on your lap? And I said, well, no. So we agreed to compromise, that he would allow me to put my single microphone, stereo microphone, on a tall stand above the conductor's head. And here am I, the orchestra, there's a 200-strong choir, beautiful acoustic of Ely Cathedral, there's an organ, and all I could do was put a stereo mic, stereo mic on top of the conductor's head. But it worked, and I'll play you this. This is the finale of part one of Dream of Drontis, recorded in a way that no engineer would ever do it, and yet it still worked out okay. Singer is 